Hello, and welcome to another episode of Crime Page by Biden It Does It. Now, today I'm coming to you from beautiful Hidalgo County, Texas, home of some of the finest taquerias in the entire continental United States. And we're starting off at the future site of a bleak retail slum so that you can get a taste of what most of the habitat known as tamalip and thorn scrub is being lost to make way for it, okay? Were you to view this area from a satellite image, you'd just see an endless expanse of parking lot. I prefer not to fluff you up with bullshit and give you the idea that all the places I go are pristine and intact uh, vestigial little pockets of wilderness because in fact they're not. They're often just little crumbs left in uh, the endless expanse of what I refer to as uh, an automobile slum, okay? It could be Hidalgo County, Texas. It could be fucking uh, uh, New Haven, Connecticut. It could be Salt Lake City, Utah. It just all kind of looks the same. You got the Panda Express, the Best Buy, the fucking Chase Bank, all the bullshit. That uh, At least, I don't know about you, but at least for me, it kind of makes me want to slowly die inside, okay? I bet there's a couple guys uh, thinking of uh, plotting their own suicide inside the Best Buy as we speak. Just being honest, no shame in that. So uh, anyway, we're going to keep moving on down the road, and I'm going to show you some of the native flora that's left. But I just didn't want to fill your head with bullshit and make you think that uh, the entire area is uh, pristine, shall we say, or intact, or you know, managed well. It's just kind of what uh, you know what was what was left over, and just by pure coincidence, didn't happen to get bulldozed yet to make uh, way for any of this shit like the Jiffy Lube and the fucking uh, Texas Roadhouse and other things that make me want to die. They got an Olive Garden over there too. Anyway, uh, as you can see, we got some Vichelia in the background, a handful of native legumes. You got the mesquite, the prosopis, of course, Iredia, wonderful member of the Braginaceae. This will all be gone soon, but uh, this is what much of the native flora looks like, as well as uh, you got all this invasive grass that probably wasn't even here 100 years ago. But uh, anyway, we're going to move on down the road. But like I said, I just prefer not to lie to you. So, uh, so there you go. Okay, coming up on uh, the edge of a lot right here, you can see you got a storage space over there. Now, this is not preserved at all. It's just by pure coincidence it hasn't been developed yet, but you got some of the vestigial native flora here, so it serves as a little time capsule for us to see what the uh, larger area looked like, you know, 100 years ago. What were some of the common uh, uh, cast of species, the members of the plant community here? You can see it's uh, invaded heavily by the buffalo grass, your penicetum ciliare. All right, but uh, this tree is a very ubiquitous uh, tree all over the region. This is Eredia Anaqua, and it's a member of the Borage family, Boraginaceae. You can see it's got the uh, little orange berries and what the shit. The birds, of course, love those. But more, more notable about this tree is the texture of these leaves. Extremely scabbard. Okay, it's got the texture of 60 grit sandpaper, and of course, it's a nice uh, deterrent to being not on by herbivores. You can see it's just covered in these berries. Very dominant tree, uh, you know, big member of the ecosystem out here, along with Cordia bassieri, which is a tree in the same family. Also, that tree, Cordia, I'll show you to you down there. In fact, you got one right over there with those big white flowers. That's known colloquially as the Texas olive. And then you can see all these bastards coming up. This is one of the, like, nine or ten species of abutilon in the region. They're pretty fast growers, okay? Nice print. This is abutilon trisulcatum. Tiny flowers. And then look at that distinct capsule right there. You got a few, uh, once they turn brown, they're ready, the seed's ready to go. Look at that, uh, that long peduncle on there, holding that fruit up. So you open that capsule, you got a bunch of tiny seeds inside. This is actually a really good uh, plant to spread around. Okay, see there's the tiny little seeds, look at that. Covering all those little barbs and what this shit. Okay, and again, there's a bunch of abutal on here. And then uh, right over here, you see our friend, uh, the old the Texas olive, which of course isn't the related to olives at all. Olives on the family Oleaceae. This is in Boraginaceae. This is a Borage. There's the flowers right there. Very beautiful tree. And to the credit of many in the region, this is a very common landscape tree. So it's one of the few native uh, species that's used in landscaping. Look at that nice Borage flower. Five fused petals fused together like a little tr like a little trumpet, kind of ruffled, huh? Don't get your panties in a bunch. There's a nice calyx. Look at all those hairs. Remember, Borage family, they all got those little stiff hairs on them. Almost all the plants in this family do. There's these, uh, there's these leaves. Look at that. Look at the texture of that leaf, huh? Look at that. All those stiff little hairs. Ooh, this feels like a, like a gentler sandpaper, maybe 200 grit or something. But still, you know, pretty scabbard. You're not going to want to gnaw on it. It's probably also got some nasty compounds in there. And then the fruit, when they're ready... Uh, this might, let's see, let's see if we can open one of these. These are the, 
these are done already. See, there's the fruit. Not quite mature yet, but it does look like an olive. So it's not a completely uh, obsolete common name. And there you go. Lovely view of the storage space in the background. Anyway, so we're going we're gonna to talk about a, something called proto-carnivory real quick. And we're going to use this as a, a case study in it. This is Passiflora feeded, a, the feeded passion flower, okay? You can see, obviously, it's already done blooming. I crack one of the fruits open. There's the seeds in there. But notice these nasty little bricks, okay? These nasty little bricks covering that fruit okay that prevents it from being eaten but there was there's also been studies on this and these glands uh, trap insects okay so this is what you would call proto carnivory not only do they trap insects but it's shown that these uh, bricks secrete enzymes which actually help digest the insects and break them down and uh, you know when when carbon isotope analyses were done you know the, the bugs were tagged with the carbon isotopes with the shit the, the carbon isotopes are actually found inside the fruits the calyx the flowers uh, etc. So, you know, it seems like the plant is actually absorbing uh, some of the nutrients from these dead bugs, okay? Let's see if we got any more. Uh, oh, that one just fell off. Yeah, look at that. Look, look at it. You got some guys stuck in there. Tiny little bastards, but they're in there. Okay, and of course, uh, there's the leaves. Typical uh, palmate uh, passion flower leaf. Now, the flowers, when they bloom, are maybe about yay big. And uh, this thing, you know, I've seen it a little bit bigger, but... Uh, you know, right here it's stopping at about like, I don't know, three feet. Over here we got a nice uh, Argemone Mexicana, the, the uh, Mexican prickly poppy, okay? One of a, quite a few species in the genus Argemone, the genus of prickly poppies. Look inside there, you can see dozens upon dozens of stamens surrounding that ovary, and that ovary has, uh, looks like it's got about five carpels on that ovary, okay? So you got like uh, five, uh, five separate uh, stigmas, all receptive and open. They got the gape on them, waiting for the pollen and whatnot. Of course, uh, so this is the uh, this is interesting too. These are the sepals. Look at that prickly sepals. Okay, defending that uh, that immature flower, and eventually these these uh, little sepals will fall off, and then you get the boom, a nice bloom. This is what the fruit looks like after the flowers are uh, are done being pounded. You can see you still got that, that stigma up on top of the fruit that'll eventually fall off. Looks like a little Turk's cap. Huh? Looks like one of the Shriners, and uh, and you got that fruit with all those spikes on it, of course. And then uh, inside that fruit, once it's mature. It'll, you know, probably uh, triple or quadruple in size. And once it's mature, you'll have a bunch of tiny little black uh, poppy seeds in there. Look at the nice variegation on the leaves. Oh, yeah. Of course, you got prickles all up and down the stem. I've seen argemone. You get a lot of argemone, you know, in the, the American Southwest, but you also get them in Chile. So there was a dispersal event of uh, the genus argemone to Chile at some point as well. I remember seeing some down there. Anyway, wonderful plant. Okay, this should be growing out more too, even though it's not uh, the most friendly. It is quite beautiful. Nice gulf fritillary area right there. And this is his uh, this is his host plant, of course. Okay, and then moving on down to a what you could call a native weed. It's it's native here, but it's weedy as hell and invasive uh, all over the globe. This is Parthenium hysteroforus, and it's a basal member of the uh, Ambrosia subtribe, Ambrosiaceae, in the sunflower family. Ambrosias, of course, are the ragweeds. Uh, these, you know, most ambrosias are wind pollinated. These are not. These are insect pollinated. You can see those five teeth-looking things stick, you know, surrounding the outside of that flower head. Those are pistillate, sort of. They're functionally female uh, ligulate flowers. Whereas all the rest of the little flowers, those tiny little white flowers on the inside, the disc flowers, are just functionally staminate. They're male. They just release pollen. They won't produce any seeds. So each flower head will only produce five seeds. Okay. This thing, uh, you know, you find all over the place. Look at the leaves down there. A bunch of different species of Parthenium. You get some tree Partheniums uh, down in Mexico. I've seen them in uh, Sonora, etc. And what this shit. Not going to spend too much time on this guy because he's fucking everywhere. But he is native here and he's an important member of the flora. Okay. Moving on down the line. Over here we got a species of uh, Thymophila. Same family, Asteraceae. This is Thymophila pentakita. And uh, this is another kind of uh, native... Uh, it's not, a, it's not as weedy as the uh, Parthenium, which is unfortunate because it's a wonderful bastard and it smells good. It's a member of the Marigold tribe. And if you look close at those uh, flowers right there, the size of those flower heads, you see those orange glands, which uh, nearly all members or many members of the Marigold tribe, the Gidea in the sunflower family have, and they smell fucking great. You might have heard of Mexican Marigold. You, many a Mexican granny has it planted in her yard. Yeah, at least in uh, you know climates where it's warm enough to grow year round, you can make a nice tea from it, okay? And it's got those same orange glands. It's got them on the leaves and everything. You also get the Thymophila tenuiloba, but that's got hairs on it. You see, these are glabrous. No hairs on these uh, on these leaves right there. And then right next to them, 
you got the Physalus cinerescens. Okay, remember the Solanaceae, same genus as uh, the golden berries that you could buy in a whole paycheck for upwards, you know, five bucks for a little carton of like 20. Extremely overpriced, very easy to grow in a garden. Not sure if the fruits of these taste that good. The one you see in a whole, whole paycheck and with the shit that's, uh, that's Physalis peruviana, it's the South American version. Okay, this is a large genus, you got species all over the place in the New World and the Neotropics. Look at that calyx on this guy though, covered in those little scales and hairs and what this shit beautiful uh five uh five fused yellow petals and then of course you got those uh those nice uh, banana shaped anthers in there okay five of those with that uh oh look at that uh, style poking up that purple style poking up in between those five anthers okay avoiding self-pollination it's pretty nice and of course here's our old friend uh verbicina and celioides okay this is a great plant uh for gorilla plantings okay at least uh, where it's able to grow again this is going to be a south uh you know a southwestern plant there's the seeds right there just take your thumb run it over there collect a couple seeds and put them in a bag okay remember the sunflower family it's either the ligules already fell off the daisy rays already fell off this one here's what they look like when they're still blooming when they're still going hard okay here's the uh look at a look at a serrate margin on that leaf right there it's pretty nice. Just the tiniest little hairs, the tiniest little, uh, you know, hair-like texture to those leaves. Flowers smell great. It could be weedy as hell. It's probably weedy as hell where it's not native. Shit, it's weedy as hell where it is native, too. It's still a wonderful plant. Look at it. There's a seed. Just let them go right there. Boom. Okay? Important for the pollinators over here. Sign of an old homestead right here. This is a, a species of Sirius in the genus Sirius, of course. Okay, which is, uh, you know, you don't. I don't think you get any native ones here. This is probably planted... You know, when it, when before any of this garbage development was here, you know, back when it was an old homestead or a little uh, ranch or something. And, uh, you know, these, of course, these have put out those big uh, red pitaya like fruits filled with a bunch of tiny little black seeds inside. And, uh, you know, the white mealy shit on the, on the inside. Wonderful uh, fruit, big flowers. Glad to see it here. You can also cut off one of those branches, stick it in the ground. Don't water it for a month. It'll send out roots. Look, you got the queen butterfly still flying around and shit. And uh, they're, they're here primarily because of this plant that I, holy shit, look at that coyote then. It's nice, hopefully they're eating some of the feral cats in the neighborhood. Okay, now, now those queen butterflies are here primarily because of this plant. One of the most important pollinator plants in the region, this is Chromalina odorata, okay? And you can see those, uh, what look like little hairs poking off uh, each one of those flower heads is uh, something that defines the tribe that this is a member of, the Eupatoriae, okay? And that's, of course, those long-ass styles, okay? If you live in the Midwest, you probably know Eupatorium. If you've, uh, you know, ever uh, ever used the sweetener stevia in your coffee, that's a member of the same tribe, Eupatoriae. Agratina is a member of the same tribe. Very important tribe. Huge food source for pollinators. And look at how big, this is probably all just one plant. Okay, tons of purple flowers. You can see it's scandent. It's so scandent. It's clamoring, clamoring up the, uh, the fucking uh, Sirius right there. Okay, and it's still going off. It's still going off. It's still blooming. You got the queens up there and with the shit, just going nuts on it. Okay, very important plant. Grown a couple of these from seed. Planted a few out in, a, you know, friends yards in the region. Very important plant to have around. It's Chromalina odorata. And uh, unfortunately, this is very invasive. Oh, shit. The log I was stepping on just broke. It's very invasive outside of the outside of the regions where it's native, you know? Like if you if you were to look this up on iNaturalist, you'd see uh, observations of it uh, all over the African continent. Okay? Very invasive outside of uh, its native ecology, but here it's a very important member of the ecology. Boom. See, look how beautiful the Texas olives are when they're going off. Look at those. Oh my god. And of course, this is a small one. They're, you know, they could be very large trees. Well, not very, but they could be a lot larger than this, you know, upwards of 20 feet tall. Look, see, there's there's more of the coyote dens. Look at them. See, they, they're, they're dragging the Texas olives in there. It's got to be, it's either a coyote or a I think it's a coyote, not a badger, because I've seen some other shit around there. Okay, and then speaking of coyote shit, look at that massive log somebody dropped over there. Now, oh, now we're here at a member of the uh, Cleomaceae, okay, in the order of mustards, brassicales. This is in the same family as, uh, if you live in California or Arizona, you'd know it as the California bladder pod, the peritoma, you know, it's in the it's just a genus perit uh, peritoma. But this is in uh, the genus Polynesia, and this is Polynesia dodecandra in the same family, Cleomaceae. 
Okay, you can see you got almost a mustard-like fruits on there, but uh, again, it's it's just in the same order as mustard, not the same family. Polynesia dodecandra, it's just about finishing up. You can see those long-ass uh, stamens with the blue anthers poking out still. The flowers are basically done. The corollas are starting to fall off, and uh, the fruit's maturing inside. But uh, this is a very important plant for the pollinators as well, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a couple of these uh, fruits. I'm going to take the seeds. I'm going to spread them around. Okay, just crack them open. Doesn't smell too good. It smells pretty terrible, but of course you'd expect that from a lot of desert plants because they don't want to be eaten. Look at these little uh, bract-like leaves going up the stem. Look at that, uh, that thick base to it on there. Oh, that's nice. And of course, you got your trifoliate, uh, trifoliate leaves more proximal to the base. Okay, this though, the, the trifoliate leaves uh, kind of taper off, but uh, and you get those little ones. Okay, because remember this is a hot, this is a hot climate plant. But closer to the base, you still got those trifoliate leaves. Anyway, there you go, Polynesia dodecandra. Okay, so moving west to the area where I just showed you. Now we're at the little crumb of habitat that's basically been turned into a just a mountain biking range. That's the only reason it's still here. Okay, you can hear the gun club in, a, in the background over there. But I wanted to show you this very specific uh, type of habitat because it's a habitat dominated by Prosopis glandulosa, which is a very important tree ethnobotanically as well as ecologically. Okay, big food source here, both for human beings, you know, for the indigenous people that live there, as well as the animals that live there. Prosopis glandulosa, of course, is uh, the honey mesquite. Okay, now we're only a mile or two from the Rio Grande, from the Rio Bravo. So the soils here are all uh, silty, sandy, alluvial deposits brought here and deposited here by the river over the last, I don't know, 100,000 years or so. The mosquitoes are fucking terrible. You can see the understory here. You got a lot of invasive buffalo grass, which is kind of quelching some of the diversity. It's kind of smothering a lot of the diversity. But you also have our old friend Opuntia anglomanii, as well as this beautiful bastard, uh, Hematocactus setispinus. Okay, you could tell it's a hematocactus. One of the defining characteristics of that genus hematocactus is these ridges. Rather than having little tubercles, okay, little prominent tubercles with the aerial on top, you got these uh, these ridges, these very uh, distinct ribs, okay? And you can see they kind of form this nice little colony right here. It'd be lovely to see them when they're flowering, okay? Beautiful yellow flowers when they're all going off. You can see they got those red fruits, almost look like a mammillaria down there. And they also have these uh, these hooked spines. See that? See how the spines are hooked? Those central spines are hooked. Nice little colony. Beautiful little colony where they're not being smothered by the buffalo grass. Look at that guy. Look how big that guy is over there. There's the soil. Okay. Now it's very dry and powdery. It kind of cracks and breaks up right now. You know, once it's uh, when it's dry, but once it gets wet, okay, you can see there's little algae and lichen and shit that just uh, come to life with uh, the slightest hint of rain, start photosynthesizing, come out of their dormancy and form this nice little uh, film all over the ground. See all those, uh, see the fruits right there? Do you see the fruits nice? They're pretty nice. How about that? I'm just getting fucking eaten alive by mosquitoes here. Those little snails, of course, those are the genus Rhabdotus. They're a native snail. Important food source for the roadrunners as well. The buffalo grass is really a drag though. I mean, you can see it just, just takes over. Okay, and here's another nice thing you'll see a lot in the areas. You'll see these piles of snail shells, and they're always around the rock like that. And it's because roadrunners will come, they'll bring these guys here, find that rock to crack them open, and uh, they'll keep coming back, bringing snails to the rock to crack them open, get the, get the juice, the meaty juice juice out of there, eat the snails, and then leave the shells. And you can see this all over this, uh, this whole floodplain area under the canopy of the mesquite. Look at that, November 5th right here, and it's still, you know, the leaves are wilting. It's fucking 95 degrees outside right now. Here's that abutilon trisulcatum again. There's that tiny little flower. You can see all those stamens on the androgynophore right there. There's the capsule up there too, maturing, okay? All the stamens, okay, all the uh, stamens with the anthers on them surrounding the androgynophore with the stigma up top. Notice the inner red part of that, uh, that corolla right there too. Okay, and in the same family is that a butylon trisulcatum in the background, you got this bastard, Melvastrum americanum. Look at the leaves just covered in those uh, stellate, the star-like trichomes, which uh, the, the cotton family Melvaceae is so uh, famous for. You can see it's still got those uh, orange five-petaled flowers. Uh, however, they're in a spike. Okay, see they're arranged in a spike. And notice the distinct uh, Melvaceous calyx on each one of those little flowers, okay? Five distinct sepals, and again, everything's just covered in those glistening stellate trichomes. 
with the palmate leaves. This is this is pretty good right here. So you get the javelinas coming through. They eat the prickly pears. I don't know how the fuck they do it. They got jaws of steel. But uh, you can see the little tracks all over the place. You know, little uh, native peccaries. But two important plants here, okay? This is called uh, the sea oxi. And uh, though we're not anywhere near the ocean right now, you know, we're still only an hour away from it, okay? That's why it's, the air is quite humid here, okay? You got quite a humid atmosphere, so it's not quite a desert, and it's also why everything is so green and lush, all right? Annual precipitation is about, I don't know, 20, uh, 20 inches a year. So this is a Borrichia frutescens, okay? Spiky bastard. Turn it over, look at those phyleries. That's what you should do with every composite, every member of the Astraceae you come across. Quite spiky phyleries. Look at that. Brutal, hard, stiff. Okay, the leaves are right there, kind of, uh, yeah, kind of dentate on the margins and uh, opposite, okay? Kind of got nice, uh, nice glaucous blue uh, tint to them, all right? And then, uh, and this again, this is mostly along the coast. It doesn't go much farther west than this, this Borrichia frutescens. And it tops out at about maybe two feet, but you can see in this open exposed area, it's doing quite well. And as you can guess, it can tolerate the salt spray as well as salty soil. We don't get any salt spray here, but the soil can be quite salty. And this one over here, unrelated, not in the Asteraceae, of course, this is in Baraginaceae, number, another member of the Baraginaceae. This is Heliotropium curasivicum, all right? Again, you got that that glaucous foliage. These leaves are quite waxy, no hairs whatsoever. It's got a mosquito on my finger. That's pretty terrible. They're fucking eating me alive right here. But uh, you got those uh, kind of scorpioid cymes right there. See, they're bending back like a scorpioid tail. Okay, a lot of a lot of members of the uh, the uh, Barrage family, the Barrage and ACA do that. And this guy kind of you know tends to sprawl out on the ground, stay kind of prostrate. But you could see he's just uh, he's having no trouble coping with that uh, that the highly alkali. Uh, you know, salty soil as well. And again, look how it just breaks up right now. It's so dry, but you get it wet, it turns into mud. Another interesting thing to note about this barricade that I forgot to mention. Okay, again, it's a member of that uh, Engelmanianae, same uh, same uh, subtribe as a uh, Silphium. But uh, look at it. That's the dried. That's the uh, dried uh, capitulum, the dried flower head. Okay, and oh, those those bracts, those spiky ass bracts, those are the pele. You can see the seeds. Will be each one of those pele will have a, a small seed attached to it. Very very spiky. All right, you can see them forming right there. Wonderful plant. I was excited to meet this fucker when I did. And again, we're at like the western edge of its range right here. You, you know, you get it. Uh, it goes uh, eastward into Florida a little bit. Then you know, like really likes the Gulf Coast. Goes on up into Georgia as well. So you know, this spot. I mean, there's there's no wildlife out right now. It's just too fucking happy. You come out here. Like, I don't know, right at sundown, right after, you'll start seeing all kinds of shit coming out the woodwork. You'll see the javelinas. Actually, you see them during the day. They're like one of the only things you see during the day. But you'll see a bunch of tiny spade foot toads crossing back and forth in a, in a road. You know, cute little bastards. You also get the Texas tortoise, gophers, berlandii. And you also get a western diamondback rattlesnakes uh, hanging out there. They don't bother you if you don't bother them. So don't go killing them like a fucking, you know, scared jagass. But, uh, you know, that's when all the stuff comes out is at night. I mean, because, again, it's just, it's so fucking hot here. And, again, you know, you also have that humidity, which makes it ten times hotter. Me, personally, I would take the dry heat over the humid heat any time of the day. See, case in point, there's an old uh, Roadrunner uh, Cochina. See, they were, uh, they were uh, doing a little uh, shell breaking over there. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm actually kind of surprised to see this guy coming up right here. This is not his typical habitat. This is a plant known colloquially as Texas sage, but it's not a sage at all. This is Leucophyllum frutescens, and it's in the family Scrofulariaceae. All right, and look at those, look at those petals. Look at those five fused petals. They're so hairy. Look at it. Jesus Christ, must be taking a Rogaine. You got that nice style poking out of the Corolla right there. Look at the leaves. Beautiful opposite leaves. It's in the order of sage, Lamiales, but it's in the family Scrofulariaceae, okay? And again, it's got those white leaves, all right? That's what leucophyllum means. Leucophyllum means white leaf. And it's, uh, you know, like I said, you don't normally see this guy coming up in this kind of habitat, you know, shaded by the Palo Verde and the Mesquite and the uh, Vichelian with the shit, all the legumes on a floodplain of the Rio Grande. You normally see him coming up on dry, open, exposed uh, calcareous habitat, you know, like limes. You'll see a lot of this on limestone flats, limestone hills, you know, especially as you get further west towards the Big Bend area. And again, it's Leucophyllum frutescens. They actually use this a lot in the native landscaping of the region as well. Leucophyllum frutescens, Scrofulariaceae. 
Oh, here we go. Now, this is pretty interesting. Nice member of the Agave family over here. This is Manfredo. This is Manfredo Longia Flora. And notice you got that nice basil rosetta leaves kind of folded up, okay? And you also got that beautiful kind of purple dot the speckling on the uh, purple polka dot speckling along the leaf blade, okay? And this is, again, it's in the Agave family. This this genus will actually hybridize with the genus Agave and uh, produce a cultivar called Mangaves, which, if you ask me, kind of sounds like some sort of lewd gay bar, you know, but uh, uh, that's just me. Anyway, when it flowers, it sends, I don't know, about a three or four foot tall uh, spike up with these rather large lily-like uh, flowers on it. Very beautiful. Uh, you, and I forgot to mention, too, the importance of this uh, canopy of mesquite, okay? Because most people think that the cacti, you know, the succulents and whatnot want the full sun. That's not always the case, okay? Especially when they're young, they, they, what is more important to them is the warmth. That keeps their metabolism going, keeps them uh, photosynthesizing and respiring, okay? That's why a lot of cacti don't do well in milder climates like, say, I don't know, the California coast. They'll, they'll hang in there, but they're not going to thrive and they're not going to grow that fast. They like the heat. All right, they like that those 80, 90 degree temperatures, but they don't like to be roasted by those intense UV rays, and that's where the mesquite comes in, provides a nice canopy, you know, to prevent them from getting too roasted, but at the same time, the climate here, you know, three quarters of the year is 90 to 100 degrees anyway, so they do fine. Okay, so moving on down the road, you can see we're in a clearing beneath a power line easement. And uh, again, you got that silty sand. These are just, remember, they're just floodplain of the Rio Grande. It's only a mile or two away still. Over here, we got what at first glance looks like it's a member of the genus Grindelia of the sunflower family. But this is a really interesting uh, genus that's in the same subtribe as Grindelia, the Macaranthera. But uh, this is Ray Jacksonia, okay? Named after a botanist named the Ray, Jack Ray Jackson. They didn't get too, uh, <laughs> they didn't get too creative with the, that genus name, huh? Regardless, it's a really cool plant. Look at those leaves. Look at those dissections. Almost looks like uh, little teeth on those leaves, okay? Highly dentate leaves. Oh, you got a, one of those green spiders hanging out. Hang out. Where'd he go? Yeah, there he is. Look at that guy. Look at that beautiful bastard hanging out in there. Look at that. How's that camouflage? Oh, he's got a bunch of little babies in there, too. That's something else. So, like all, uh, like all, uh, all members of the, the uh, Asteraceae, the sunflower family. We're going to flip this guy over. I don't want to disturb that spider. We're going to flip this guy over. Look at his phyleries in there. Oh, yeah. Look at it. Look at all the glands, hairs and glands on the leaves. multi serried phyleries. Those, uh, those leaves are kind of oppressed up to the, uh, the axis of the plant. So you got to get, and again, highly glandular. Oh, yeah. Very, really sticky, just like Grindelia, just like the gumweeds. So peel those leaves down. Look at those phyleries, multi serried phyleries. You got the glands, you got all the good shit, you got the yellow ligules, okay? And he even got some seed on this guy. Look at that guy, right? Look at those, look at those. Just a capitulum full of seed. Look at that. So I'm gonna take a couple of these back, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grow them out. This guy, you get him east into Louisiana, kind of hugs the Gulf Coast, okay? Ray Jacksonia, Phyllocephala, okay, and like because he hugs the Gulf Coast, like many of the plants that do, so you could guess he's uh, pretty tolerant to salt. And I'm willing to bet that this soil, like uh, the soils I just showed you back uh, back east a little ways, is full of salt. A nice open clearing where the mesquite can't grow, probably because it's a little too salty. Anyway, look at the fruits on this Opuntia engelmanii, this prickly pear. Doesn't look like they got any uh, blatant spikes on them, but they do have glockids inside those little areoles. Glockids, of course, are uh, what the members of the cactus subfamily Opuntioideae have. Okay, and only the Opuntioideae produce glockids. Glockids are those irritating little fiberglass hairs that get stuck in your skin so nice, as you can see right there. These, these are rather large glockids. So anyway, all cactus fruit is edible. Some's not necessarily palatable, but my money is on these being delicious, and indeed they are. You could scrape off that skin and you get a nice, delicious, sweet fruit in there. And again, those are red pigments are not anthocyanins like uh, most flowering plants produce. Most anthos, most of the flowering plants produce red pigments called anthocyanins. Members of the order Caryophyllum Phyllales, which uh, beets are in and which cacti are, are in as well, produce uh, red pigments called betalanes in lieu of anthocyanins. Only two families, only two or three families in the Caryophyllales order produce true anthocyanin pigments. The rest all produce betalane pigments. And that's, uh, that's what comes out uh, when you take a shit after you ate some beets. You got that, you know, it makes you think you got colon cancer or something. That's because of the betalane pigments. 
Anyway, there you go. Beautiful little punch of Engelmania. Okay, more evidence of uh, the presence of salt in these soils. This is an indicator plant uh, for salt. This is Sesuvium varicosum, and it's a member of the ice plant family, Isoaceae. But again, it's in that the larger order, Caryophyllales. Okay, you got, the, you got your five petals right there, succulent foliage. You can almost see the salt crystals on the foliage right there. Okay, and see it's just got this kind of sprawling habit. Habit. It can get a little bit uh, taller, but right now it's got the sprawling habit, just kind of, you know, prostrate on the ground. Tiny little pink flowers over here and there. Okay, you'll see this a lot in a open uh, tamalip and thorn scrub as well, just like uh, you got here. You could talk a lot of shit on, uh, you know, power lines and power line easements, but I will say they do provide the necessary disturbance to give a lot of plants the habitat and the sun exposure they would need so they don't get smothered out. I see it a lot, you know. I mean, who knows what the, who knows what disturbance regimes kept the habitat uh, appropriate for many of these sun-loving species in the past. But right now, I can tell you one of the main things doing it is these uh, power line easements where they got to clear the brush. You got to, they can't let it uh, get too tall and take over. Look at all the nice, uh, this of course is just the dormant, uh, dormant cyanobacterial film. Get it wet and it'll turn to jelly. Start photosynthesizing. Oh yeah, okay. Here's another plant where we're at the western edge of its range right here. And it's another plant that kind of tends to hug the Gulf Coast. This is Ly Lyceum carolinianum uh, of the nightshade family Solanaceae. All right, this goes on uh, eastward into about uh, eh, Florida, maybe southern Georgia as well. And it's uh, you know very tolerant of the salty soil and the salt spray. And it's another indicator plant for just how salty uh, this soil is. Okay, produces an edible berry, a sweet edible berry, goji berries, though it's that, that species in that case is, a, you know, far removed. It's a native to Asia, grows about 9,000 miles away from here. It's in the same genus as this, that genus Lyceum, again, in the nightshade family Solanaceae. And notable for this one is it's got those uh, four petals. You know, most members of the nightshade family tend to have five, five fused petals. This one's only got four, and uh, four stamens as well with that uh, green stigma topping that style right in the center. Okay, here's, a, here's another uh, interesting plant, and this one's actually quite rare. This is a member of the Plantagenaceae, the Penstemon family. This is a Stemodia shatii, all right? It's a tiny little annual, okay? And it's, a, I believe it's a Texas endemic, okay? And it's, a, you know, a, quite rare. It does, it's, not the, it's not too widespread. Look at that beautiful uh, purple Corolla, okay? Looks like a little snapdragon. Waxy glaucous leaves with a dentate margin on the leaves right there. Just coming up out of that uh, cracking, bone dry, salty, silty clay soil. With a nice little sprinkling of rhabdota shells in the background. You see, look at it, all that salty soil. Now why is the soil so salty, you might be asking? Well, there's a number of reasons, okay? Hot, arid climates, okay, even though we do have a lot of humidity here, Comparatively speaking to other desert areas, it's still a, a very hot arid climate. Hot arid climates, you get more uh, evaporation than in other areas. So even though it, uh, we get 20 inches of rain here a year, you know, it rains and, uh, and then it washes, uh, washes material and uh, various uh, precipitous minerals, precipitate minerals out of the rocks and then that water just evaporates before it even gets a chance to drain off, leaving a bunch of salt in the soil. But also, you, uh, because of capillary action of water, you also get the salt coming up from down below. So there might be salt deposits, I don't know, 30, 40 feet below, uh, below the ground level here. And because of the capillary action of the water and its interaction with the soil, you get that salt actually coming up from below. So that's why you technically get the, you typically get salt in a lot of these uh, regions in the Rio Grande Valley.